Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ask the Gardener on Friday 1 o'clock here on Facebook and also of course going out on LinkedIn and on YouTube. In a while you'll be delighted to hear I'll be chatting again with Coleman Power up in Kildare if I can bring him down to planet Earth after his latest book The Power of Organic Fitness is number one across the uh, Amazon uh, bestsellers list. So congrats to Coleman on that. I've no doubt he'll tell us more about that in a minute. I must turn my phone to silent, excuse me. Uh, I have no doubt he'll tell us a bit more about that in a while. Now, in the meantime, before I get to Coleman, there's a few questions which have come in during the week, which I want to get to first, and we'll get through them quickly. Uh, Mag sent in this one from Dublin 15. Um, in case I can't watch you live, would you be able to give a bit of advice on the best flowers that do well in Dublin 15? Not shrubs, just flowers that come every year. Now, um, Mags, I'm always <laughs> slow when I see a question like that. Well, what, like, when you're asked to advise on particular plants, there's, a, there's so many to choose from. But what I would start maybe is just give you a couple of general tips and a couple of general ideas. And it's to get continuity of colour. So it's very easy just to get fill the garden with colour right now. And of course, we're enjoying such fine weather. Now is really when we get value out of the garden, isn't it? Now is when we're out there and enjoying it. But I would start with some spring bulbs like, you know, snowdrops, crocus, muscari, all those very, very early ones, even some winter aconites and some early dafts that they'll all come into flower, maybe even in December, December, January, February. Then you move on. And of course, the muscari and the crocus are loved by the bees. So they're an important one to plant as well. Then you move on throughout the spring season, maybe into some daffodils maybe some tulips then bringing into April uh, and then of course the alliums the best of all of them the alliums which will bring you right up to now really in terms of colour and then what you're looking for really mags then I think uh, for summer colour is the perennials as opposed to your bedding plants so perennials are quite simply plants that that will come on every year don't ever be scared of the terms uh, herbaceous perennial it's not just so the likes of us can pretend we know what we're talking about Herbaceous just means a plant that will die back for the winter. Perennial means it comes on every year. So that's what a herbaceous perennial is. I would look at things maybe like peonies that would be early summer, into the dahlias. Uh, salvias are a fabulous one. Rudbeckia, you know, the black-eyed Susan. And they'll all do in Dublin 15. They'll do in Cork. They'll do anywhere in Ireland, really. Um, the Rudbeckia is that black-eyed Susan will keep going along with some of the salvias right into the autumn, bringing it to the first frost. So like with just kind of a good selection of bulbs and perennials, you get all the way from, let's say, December, January to maybe September, October. So you have great continuity of colour with that. Hopefully that answers your mags. If you want some more specific suggestions, do feel free to come back to us. Uh, a lot of people were, were, were watching. I put up a video during the week. It's still there on the page. You'll see it, how to take lavender cuttings. I was showing Dahi on the Today Show before we finished the season uh, how to take cuttings of lavender. And I put up that little clip during the week. And, of course, it, it got great traction because everybody seems to love it. And everybody seems to love lavender. So there's been a lot of comments in. And here's one from Sharon. Sharon is saying to me, if your lavender plant has got leggy and woody, what's the best thing to do with it? And I suppose that question kind of sums up many of the questions which have come in about lavender. And it is prone to getting woody and leggy in this climate. And that's because you think about where it's native to. It's native to the warm countries, you know, the Mediterranean regions where it's growing in very, very poor soil. You, you nearly see it just growing on the side of the road or in the crack in a wall. So we get it here into Ireland and of course it's been grown in the best of compost in the nursery and in the garden centre. We bring it back to our garden, it's going into rich good soil. As much rainfall as it could ever dream of, we're probably giving it tomato food and plant food. And so the lavender thinks it's in heaven. So the lavender is just flowering and flowering and flowering and growing and growing and growing. And it, it tends as a result then just to get very, very woody. The trick is to stop it doing that because if you let it do that, and this is the bad news for you, Sharon, I'm sorry, if you let it get very woody, it won't respond well to being cut back hard. So the tip with lavender, I would say always, is be constantly kind of trimming it. I would say all plants are, are low maintenance. Nearly all plants are low maintenance. There's no such thing really as a high maintenance plant. And I live with three women, so I know all about high maintenance. Now, <laughs> two of them are my daughters, uh, but I do know a bit about high maintenance. And plants, I think, are low maintenance. Lavender is one of the exceptions where you'll be cutting it back regularly through the year. Most other plants you can leave well alone, maybe cut them back once a year. But lavender does need regular trimming, Sharon. So that's what I would say. Every time you've, a flush of flower is finished, cut, cut back the dead flower stems and cut into the foliage a bit and keep it good and bushy and compact and avoid it getting leggy in the first place. 
so Sharon I'm afraid if it's got very very leggy you could try just trimming it back see if it improves it but it might be a case of taking it out and replacing it when it does do that Breeda then is showing off Breeda Peter this is my lavender a single plant about 20 years old at this stage uh, never fails to impress with no TLC. Now Breeda sent in a picture of it so I'll show everyone Breeda's lavender that's it there and it is pretty impressive Breeda I must say uh, with no TLC uh, so <laughs> not, not, not much uh, consolation to Sharon a minute ago with hers that has gone woody that is lovely and you can see from that picture why, why wouldn't you just adore lavender really really is uh, a fabulous plant. Now uh, Colin, um, there was one before Colin there, just one sec, sorry. Um, do, 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 do. Anna MacDonald. Oh, sorry, Laura. Laura's asking about a peace lily. So, my peace lily is dying. I already replanted. What else can I do to bring it back to life? Well, Laura, you didn't send me a picture, but I'm going to guess, so the, the reason the picture would help is because I could see whether we can bring it back to life or, or whether it's gone past it. I suspect without seeing it, because this can be quite a, quite a common problem with the peace lily, that you either overwatered it or it got a bit drafty and a bit cold. With houseplants, I would always err on the side of underwatering. If they need water, they'll tell you very dramatically. They'll start drooping and you have plenty of time to fix it. You have plenty of time to give them water. But if we give them too much water, we, it, it's very difficult to fix that. It's very easy to fix underwatering, but not overwatering. And I suspect without seeing it that it's either too much water or it got too cold. And particularly if they're in a drafty area near an opening window or an opening door, that can affect them a lot. The peace lilies, they'll do very well actually indoors in, a, in an area of low light. So they're a great plant for that but not for drafts and open windows and things like that. So maybe it's one of them, Laura. Hopefully, hopefully that answers it. Anna uh, has come on to us from Canada. So hello, Anna. I hope you're watching today. I live in Canada. I love perennial flower gardening. I see lots of your lovely posts. I'm delighted to hear it. Thank you. Uh, I just don't know why I'm receiving the Irish Gardener posts all the way over there in Canada. Well, I don't know either. I know we've quite, got quite a lot of, of viewers and followers actually in Canada and in the States, but are you in the same time zone as me? I'm not, Anna, I'm afraid. I'm on the other side of the Atlantic. I'm the Irish gardener in Ireland, in Cork. And the next part of your question, I'm not going to be able to help with, really. What can you tell me about gardening near Ottawa in zone four and five? Well, you get to minus 10 and minus 20 in that part of the world, so I'm afraid... I have a tiny bit of experience in it from, uh, was it 2018 when we got the beast from the east here in Ireland? But no, it, it's uh, not, not something I'm really up on, and I'm sorry about that, but welcome to, to the programme and thanks for watching. Uh, and do feel free to send us in a picture of your garden in Canada. We'd love to see it. Now, uh, Yvonne has sent this one in. Every time I get an anthurium, this happens. I've tried soapy water, cutting it all back. It's indoors and no other houseplant has the same problem. Any ideas? Well, uh, I do, Yvonne, and I'm just going to bring up the picture there that you sent in of the anthurium. And here it is, and you'll see, the, if you look closely there, you'll see those little white dots on, on the flower bud. They're actually all tiny little flies. And these little flies, uh, they, they, they lay their eggs and hatch in the compost or in the soil at the base of the plant, at the top of the pot. And I suspect, uh, Yvonne, that that is what's happening, that maybe, you're, again, maybe it's getting a bit too damp, maybe you're giving it too much water. The anthuriums, you must remember, are, um, are the, uh, sorry, I'm confusing myself here, the anthuriums are um, tropical plants and they don't like that much water, again, it's that beautiful, waxy, nearly artificial looking flower in them, but they don't like too much water and they do like to be kept quite warm. So. When the, water get, when the soil gets quite damp, the flies are attracted to it, they lay their eggs in it and then they, they attack the plant. So ease off in the watering, Yvonne, would be my first piece of advice. And the second thing is get some kind of like lecca, you'll find lecca, which is a volcanic rock, an expanded rock, or expanded clay rather. Uh, you'll get it, you should get it in most garden centres. So that or a type of any kind of small gravel, if you cover the top inch of the pot with a gravel or a lecca, so that the flies can't get easily to the soil. That will, should anyway, help quite a lot, Yvonne. So hopefully that will, will help you with the anthurium. Um, a couple of other messages coming in there now. That was Yvonne's. Colin, Colin Downey via LinkedIn. Hi, as you know, we are in India. We have several varieties of basil 
locally called Tulsi. Uh, and Colin knew that I would be speaking to Coleman in just a minute about Basil. And he sent us in. A, Colin is from Belfast originally, and he is living over there in India. And he sent us in a picture of his Indian Basil. Uh, and he has, they have several different varieties. And he has a question for Coleman, actually, as well, which I'm going to bring up. Um, and it's here. If I can find it again. Uh, by planting basil. Here we are. By planting basil, can it get rid of mosquitoes in the garden? Colin and Alka in Delhi. And I think that's a very apt and opportune time to now hand over to, Co uh, to Coleman. So we're going to have a chat with Coleman Power up in Kildare uh, about all things basil. I know. Coleman, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Peter. How are we? I'm very good, thank you. How is it all up in Kildare? We're doing all right. And thanks for that, I suppose. Uh Massive shout out in relation to the number one Amazon first <laughs> ever. I thought you might mention it again, all right. Oh, God almighty, I'm going to be saying it for the next two and a half years as long as it took me to write it, that's for sure. Well, uh, it's a fair achievement. Congratulations. And for anyone who's just tuning in, uh, Coleman's book, the, Am I Right? The Power of Organic Fitness, Coleman, has just yeah, reached number sure one is. in the Amazon bestsellers list. So congrats on that. Well done and continued success. Now, if I could bring you back down to planet Earth, can we answer, can we answer Colin's question about basil? and mosquitoes? You certainly can. Uh, plants such as the likes of basil have a quite distinctive scent and it can be something that can be incorporated into either a veg patch or more so in warmer countries but in more importantly in the likes of a polytunnel. It can deter some flies. In Ireland we don't have a major I suppose, issue with the likes of mosquitoes but uh, in the likes of Delhi it can most certainly help. Uh, more so going towards my area of expertise growing in Ireland, it is something that I do recommend. Firstly, because for its massive flavor, but for its antioxidants, okay? Basil is an adaptogenic herb. It's very easily grown in Ireland. The benefits of it is it helps the body deal with stress. The more antioxidants you get in your diet, the better it is for your health, okay? More antioxidants, less stress, more energy. Everyone would, look, would most certainly look for more energy, and okay, it doesn't come in a tablet, it doesn't come in a supplement, it comes in, the absolute classic basil okay i and have sown these seeds and i always label all the dates of the items that i grow so this is italian basil and it was most certainly sown on the 20th to the 5th correct me if i'm wrong that is may so we've just gone past the date when i would recommend sowing them so what you can do is most certainly buy a plant yourself or if you do know someone who has an abundance of them they might be able to get give you a bit of a trade. Bartering is what I do love to see, uh, going back to, I suppose, simpler times. And with the likes of basil, uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of other different uh, strategies, how to most certainly preserve it. So a lot of people will buy a basil plant, or if you grow your own, I do recommend five cells or five seeds per cell or per pot, but they must be grown inside. I must highly recommend that because just as Peter said, it's always remember where the plant is originally from. Mediterranean, likes the warm climate, loves the heat, just like myself and Peter. So we like and we need to be, uh, the basil more so, to be kept inside in warm conditions. Either a glass house or a pie tunnel, these are, or a warm windowsill will also work. So I know I'm out here on the veg patch, I just brought it out to show you, like it's a lovely veg patch up here in Kildare where we do the grow your own courses and show people how to suppose, be more sustainable and improve their overall health with eating foods like this. So first way to preserve the life of the likes of your basil would most certainly be the likes of incorporating not just buying one plant or sowing one pot of it have numerous pots this is two if i could grab the third and the fourth you can have numerous amount of basil plants on the go at any one time and what that's going to do is it is most certainly going to have less stress on the plant because what inevitably happens what people just end up going is oh god i'd love a bit of tomato and basil pesto this evening so they literally pick all the leaves off typically they go for the lower ones for what reason i'm not 100 sure and what does a plant need to make food for itself that is most certainly leaves so here's the tip of the day with basil different to other plants what you want to do is only take the top two emerging leaves so i'm going to take an example right here this is one main leader of a stem and we're going to be able to see this all the way from the soil or the compost all the way to the top. So you don't want to take the lower leaves, there's one petal here, second one there on the other side. What we're looking to do is take the top, okay, leader. And as a result of that, I'm going to show you now maybe from the likes of this, we've just taken the leader 
And from there, there are two small side shoots that will be produced. It's, I suppose, a different way of harvesting. Uh, it's total opposite to the way the tomatoes are trained for anyone that does grow a little bit of their own. You want to remove the side shoots. For this, you want to most certainly take the leader. Can't wait to have that with my lunch. Uh, so it's something that prolongs the life of it. Why? Because you take off one to get two more side shoots. But it has to give it a little bit of time. So now I have the other opportunity to pick the main leaders off the likes of this basil and then I'll prolong it. And there's a sure example I'm going to show you guys. I've taken the leaders off this one, the center one, if anyone can see that there. The main leader was taken off in the middle. And then what inevitably happened is the two side shoots come left and right of that. Hope everyone can see that. I've taken the main leader, which is here, away. And as a result of that, then one side shoot to the left, one side shoot to the right. So I can then take the leader of this one that came out the side and the leader of this one when it gets a little bit larger in, we'll say, a week or so when I put them back into the python in this lovely warm weather that we're currently having here midsummer. And that's one of the major tips with prolonging the life, okay? So firstly, having more than one plant. Secondly, taking the likes of the leaders and something that you can do simply either growing them in pots as I said warm windowsill or glass house or polyton does that make sense hope if anyone has any questions make sure you pop it in the comments question question section below and myself and peter will get into it peter what do you think of that trick we can't hear you i'm not sure peter can hear me i hope he can hear me Sorry, Coleman. Can you hear me there? We can hear you loud and clear. My apologies. I muted myself to let you have center stage, and then I forgot to switch it off again. Uh, what I was saying is, what you were saying in very everyday language is a thing. You're preventing a thing called apical dominance by t pinching out that terminal bud or the leader. You're forcing the lateral buds into growth, which is, of course, as you say, going to prolong the life. And aren't I right in saying, Coleman, or am I right in saying? that once you've done that and as you go through the season with basil like with, with most plants then you, you you keep pinching back but what actually with basil don't you take off the leaves to allow those shoots in the leaf axles to come on again afterwards take off the big fat leaves so like in my understanding a working basil plant if you want to call it that like in the kitchen will never look brilliant and it's as you say that's why you'll have maybe 10 or 12 of them on the go that it because you're constantly taking the big fat leaves to allow the small side ones to come on again am i right in saying that yeah, you're dead right. And it's something that I suppose happens in the likes of anything. Do you know what I mean? We'll take the example of grass. You don't want to leave your grass to go too long and leggy. You take the tops off it and it tillers. It thickens up. And that's what you want from the likes of your basil to give you a numerous amount of harvest, maximizing the benefits of the crops and the foods and the fruits and the vegetables and the herbs that you grow is what people are looking to do. Good. Now, there's a couple of questions coming in there. I just want to quickly go through them. That's from Anne Sheehan, a great crop of potatoes again. No, that's just a thank you. You're very welcome, Anne. I'm delighted to hear they were so well. Uh, there's a Peonies question coming in from Una. Many thanks. There's lots of, love the smell of basil from Evelyn. Um, everyone's enjoying it anyway, Coleman. You'll be glad to hear. That's good. It's yeah. Good to hear good news. No, I just have this one here from Evelyn again. I would like to know where best to get eco-friendly raised bed surrounds. Not 100% sure what you mean by that one, Evelyn. Any thoughts, Coleman? Yeah, and she's right. She was the likes of treated timber, which could have the likes of creso in it, is something that she might be uh, leaning towards. And sorry, I, I, I guess, sorry to call me. Yeah, of course, now that I read the question properly, that is the question, yes. So you don't use railway sleepers for your, for your raised beds, absolutely, because of the creosote, yes. So it's pressure treated. Um, I would say any, any local hardware store or garden centre, would you think, Coleman? Yeah, most certainly. And there's a one that uh, I have no affiliation with them. I'm just passing on, I suppose, uh, the knowledge that I do currently have. It's the likes of an, uh, an edging called Everedge that can be connected together to make it either a straight line or a weaves or a meandering kind of a line for your raised beds. And it's something that is very important. I'm just gonna to touch on it here. With the likes of raised beds, it's not the first thing I recommend to people. Most certainly, why? Because with raised beds, you do have to incorporate in more watering. So if you're looking for, I suppose, less effort in relation to watering, you could most certainly grow in the likes of a bed that's flat down on the floor. I do know there's raised beds behind me. That's just something that I do incorporate in when I 
mentor, coach, and people to grow a little bit of their own, asking them why do they want to raise bed. It's, if it's for back problems, most well, certainly raise your beds up. But always remember that water will fall down to its lowest point, and that means you're going to incorporate in the likes of uh, more and need to incorporate either drip irrigation or hand watering by yourself. It's a little more labor intensive. So it's the point uh, that I do recommend people to know why you have raised beds because for the most part, this raised bed is a foot off the ground. But if you're looking to save your back, inevitably you're still going to have to bend down. So there's just an important point uh, to incorporate into uh, your veg patch, either that you have or that you're setting up. So that is something that I do recommend. Another way of setting up a bed for yourself is if you have grass right now, is covering it with the likes of anything at all, whether it be plastic, I hope uh, you can reuse the plastic or some sort of mypex. And then as a result of that, after a period of, uh, we call it two to three months, you can open up the ground and plant directly into that. That is a way of using you know, zero chemicals and having, I suppose, all the nutrient dense uh, hum humus at the top layer of the soil, which are all the nutrients are found in, to plant directly in whatever fruits or vegetables that you do have uh, to plant into. Yeah, it's a good question from Evelyn because, uh, as we say, railway sleepers can't be used because of the creosote content, obviously. Old scaffolding boards are another thing which people should be aware of. You should never use near when you're growing food because obviously the chemicals from paint and the other, the other materials that could be in the scaffolding boards will get into the soil. So be careful of that. You'll often see them recommended. You shouldn't. And you often also as well see a lot of, of, of plastic products like plastic raised beds and that on the marketplace. Be very careful of them too because if it's not food grade plastic, it's not right to be growing food in it. So do be careful. And it's a very good question, Evelyn, that you're asking. The Everedge, which you're talking about, Coleman, I use myself quite a lot and it's a very good thing are also a raised bed doesn't always have to have size as you're referring to as well there Coleman just by practicing no dig and put, I wouldn't use plastic myself but like even just putting cardboard or old newspaper or anything on top of grass and just then building on top of that with soil and compost and organic material and planting straight into that that in itself a raised bed doesn't actually have to have sides the advantages of course of the raised bed the disadvantage perhaps is the watering but the advantage are your your you can create your own soil type if you like so if you want to grow carrots but you've got very stony soil of course a raised bed will help uh, also it was believed in in medieval times and who am i to argue that plants did better because they were raised that much closer to god who knows maybe it's god maybe it's the sun i'm certainly not going to argue but plants do tend to do very well in raised beds and i see colin who was asking you about the basil uh, uh, uh coleman who's based over in india has just come back he's, he's he's always on the ball in fairness to him uh and he's answering evelyn's question here try zincalume if i'm pronouncing it correctly curved sheets for raised beds we can supply <laughs> so well done colin <laughs> So that's via LinkedIn. They use them a lot in Australia, he's saying. So you can find Colin, I'm sure, on LinkedIn and connect with them. Uh, and maybe he, he'd be uh, the right man to give you your raised bed materials. Uh, Evelyn, is thank you. You're very welcome. And Colin, Colin, straight back in on LinkedIn. I'll send you a link. So, so we'll probably have a link in the comments here. Uh, uh, and and uh, you, you can follow up on that one, Evelyn. Now, I just want to move to a few more questions here. Geraldine is asking me... My irises won't flower in my small water pond. Um, ah, this question came in recently as well. Deep sigh from Peter because it's a difficult one to answer. Uh, when it's in a water pond, you can't really feed it with anything, in my, my opinion, because you don't want to be contaminating the water. So I think it's just going to be a question of time and maybe positioning. So if your pond, obviously you're not going to be able to reposition the pond or certainly not that easily, but maybe where in the pond you have the iris growing. So it, irises do like quite a lot of sunlight. Um, it may be a question of the pot size as well and the pot depth so and it depends on having the right iris so obviously bearded irises and things like that and the siberian irises won't do well in a pond but if you have the right ones like fetidissima or something like that or the stinking iris they'll all do fine so i'm not giving you a definite answer geraldine i'm afraid but first of all make sure you have the right iris for the pond and second of all, uh, make sure it's in a sunny position in the pond. And thirdly, make sure it's in the right size pots. I'm not, I can't give you a specific answer, I'm afraid, but hopefully maybe some of that might help you. There was a question which came in there a minute ago from Una. Um, my peonies didn't flower at all this year. The leaves are now turning brown around the edges. Could it be lack of nutrients and everything else around them has flowered? 
No, Una, I don't think it's lack of anything. Uh, no, the only thing you, you don't say, Una, maybe if you're still watching, you might throw it in the comment. Is it the first or second year of your p &E? So I think maybe it's just too young and maybe it's taking time to establish. However, if it's an established p &E that just never flowered this year, then it could be lacking in something like potassium or phosphorus. So a good quality, uh, like the Nature Safe tomato food, would be the one I would use to, to drive it on for next year. It's too late for this year. The leaves going brown at this time of the year and dying off, totally normal, totally natural. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, just cut them off for tidiness if you want with a scissors or a secretaire's. But if it's a new plant, Una, and what I mean by new is if it's less than three years old, I'd say it's just a question of uh, uh, all of us gardeners' favourite word, patience. So it will come good. Uh, I'm going to bring up Emma's one here, which may be for you, Coleman. My strawberries have taken over one of my raised beds. Would it be detrimental uh, to them to dig them out when they are finished? Sorry, when, would it be detrimental to dig them out when they're finished fruiting and put them in pots until next year so I can use the bed for other edibles? I suspect uh, I, I'm right, uh, Coleman, in saying that you'd highly recommend that, yeah? Yes, and, and that's a very important thing to do. Maximise the space that you do currently have. And once you have, I suppose, your, hop, your crop harvested from the likes of your strawberries, which is an organic fitness food. Why? Because the likes of uh, fruits can be sprayed up to 10 times in a growing season, which is very important to either grow your own or buy chemical free or organic produce. Strawberries then can be potted on and you can start sowing once they're finished. The likes of anything that could go into the ground right now, spring onions would be great. You could um, most certainly do a couple of brassicas. You could do radishes. It would be a quick return. You would have purple top Milan uh, would be another really good one and after that then if you are growing those brassicas make sure you cover with a net I'm sure there's a netting behind me at some uh, view you can see behind me why because you do have that uh, caterpillar which we were talking about that can cause havoc on your brassicas and then once we do lean towards september i start to get people to sow oriental salads outside so that is your rocket your mensuni your tatsoys which are able to tolerate the cold because they are most certainly related to kale and brussels sprouts that do like that little bit of a colder uh, climate so i was actually on to someone this morning they said all their cauliflower had bolted because remember again broccoli cauliflower although are from the brassica family and they do like the colder conditions so if you have the likes of your cauliflower either in under a netting right now which actually increases their temperature slightly it's something that can cause drought the soil to dry out and then they both they go to flower and we're looking for the edible part of the flower uh, the edible part of the cauliflower or the broccoli for that matter and it's not what you want so grow with the seasons and we'll certainly take out those strawberries put them into pots so you can use them for next year's growing season and put in uh, whatever vegetable crop that you would uh, like to harvest and the most important fruit and vegetable to eat and grow is the one you'll eat the most of i always see beautiful flowers and i wonder how can i take them cuttings and help them growing in my garden. That's a sure question for Peter. Which back <laughs> up my man here. He's on my other side on the left. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I, I like that advice about the most important vegetable to grow is the one you're going to use the most. Simple advice, but very true advice. So yes, so Ellie's asking, uh, I always see beautiful flowers and I wonder how do I take a cutting of them and help them to grow in my garden? Well, it does depend to a certain degree, Ellie, on the plant, on which flower it is and which plant it is that you're looking at. So from that point of view, it's going to be, get a bit specific. But I have a video up, which I put up on my own page here this week, on how to take cuttings from lavender. And I have one coming up very soon on how to take cuttings, if it's not up already, on how to take cuttings from hydrangeas. So have a look at the two of them. Hopefully, I'm hoping that uh, I explained it relatively well. And if you follow the same principle on whatever plant you're taking, this year's growth a few inches of this year's growth, normally about pencil thickness. Obviously for lavender, it's not going to be anything like that, but for, for a lot of plants, the base of the cutting should be at a node because that's the magical part of the plant. That's, uh, that's where all the auxins are and the other hormones. The auxins will, will stimulate root development. So have a look at the one that I did there during the week on lavender. There was one coming up uh, on hydrangeas, as I say, if it's not up already, and that should give you some tips as to, to, to how to do most plants, really, I, I think, Ellie. So hopefully that helps you with that. Uh, there's a question here as well then from Geraldine uh, I, this is for Coleman right back at you Coleman also how uh, can also I make my tomatoes red sorry my tomatoes are big and healthy so how can I make my tomatoes red Coleman and there's another part of that question my tomatoes are big and healthy just not red they are in the greenhouse I wonder are we being a bit impatient Geraldine but anyway Coleman go on 
No, I'll give you a couple of the tips then. It happens, I suppose, on a regular basis because what you need and we need for tomatoes to ripen is sunlight. And what ends up happening is right now there's a lot of green foliage in the glass house or the polytunnel, wherever your uh, tomatoes are growing. So you either have to remove some of the lower leaves and leave direct sunlight on to the likes of your tomato flesh, which will incorporate in, I suppose, those beneficial antioxidants and that is the main point so you need more sunlight so inevitably increase the spacing of your tomatoes depending on I'll see if I might manage, right? uh, is something that I do recommend. So removing the lower leaves up to, I suppose, around the fruits, allowing more light and more airflow, okay? That is something that I do recommend. Also to incorporate the ripening of tomatoes is another key thing, is to lighten off on the watering, okay? Because excessive amount of watering will and then we get the plant to grow taller. And what we're looking for right now is to have our green tomatoes ripen that little bit quicker for us. So lightening off in the water, causing a small bit of stress. So inevitably that the tomato will send its energy into the likes of the fruits because that's where all the energy is uh, needed for ripening of our tomatoes. We're a bit, yep, I done that, so Geraldine just came in there. So she's done all that. So I think she, you're doing the right thing, Geraldine. Um, and just just give it time a bit of sunshine now this weekend hopefully will uh will, will help expedite matters but it's probably still a bit early i would say coleman for for tomatoes to be ripening isn't it oh well they in and around now and it depends on the variety as well uh on the likes of the next course that we're doing up here i have 13 different varieties and we'll be going through how to prune them we're going through how to double train them which is a technique that i'm doing right here one plant two main leaders left and right and if anybody's looking to come to that you can either contact me directly it's the point of which is growing tomatoes that ripen a little bit earlier and the earliest variety that i found myself personally would be the likes of sun gold it's an f1 variety and it's one of the most extremely sweet to taste uh, cherry tomatoes and they typically come into i suppose ripening as of the start of this month and that's why I do grow them on a yearly basis. And for anyone who is thinking of doing a little bit of growing your own, definitely check out that variety, Sun Gold F1 variety. Coleman, great information and the kitchen garden once more. Thank you very much for joining us again. For those watching, if we've answered any of your questions and if you've enjoyed the video at all, do please feel free to share it or tag anybody in the comments below who might be interested. It really does help to get the video seen. So, so do please give it a share. I'd much appreciate it. Um, and in the meantime, until next Friday, I hope you enjoy the garden in the sunshine, uh, the very hot sunshine over the next few weeks. It's going to be a bit challenging. Goldman's going to enjoy it in Kildare. But between, between 30 degrees and number one on the Amazon bestsellers list. There'll be no living <laughs> with them next week, right? But um, uh, just bear in mind that obviously you're going to be watering the garden quite a lot, but do bear in mind there are other ways to conserve water. You obviously you have water butts for when it rains, but even just mulching around your plants with, with the bark mulch or organic material, any homemade compost, anything, will just improve the soil and reduce water loss through evaporation. Pay particular attention to any plants that are new. And what I mean by new is planted within the last 12 months because they will all be vulnerable if we do get a long dry spell, which hopefully we will get a long dry spell. So guys, thanks, thanks to Coleman once again. Thanks to everyone for watching. Do please feel free to share the video. And until next Friday, enjoy the garden. Thanks very much.